Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Ryan Rampersad to talk about e-voting. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED26. So, Ryan. Hello, Ian. E-voting refers to... Well, it's kind of a really broad topic, right? It's extremely broad, and what e-voting refers to you might not necessarily what it means to somebody else. Right. Okay. So I think I think that like the the most broad that we could define e-voting as is like using any electronic devices to aid in any part of the voting process, right? I think that's as broad as it gets. Yep. And so like most of the elections in the modern world are technically like e-voting right That's correct. Because, because they use like electronic means to count up all of the the votes right we wouldn't have been able to know who was going to be our mayor as of 10 p.m right, right? you know so at least here in the united states mm-hmm. at least here in minnesota at least here in st paul yep we for sure have these uh voting machines mm-hmm. so you you kind of go through the the line to get your voting ballot mm-hmm. and you a physical paper paper thing ballot yep. and then you go into the little voting booth made out of plastic and mm-hmm. you take your little pen and squiggle into the boxes which person you like this is what standardized testing has like prepared us for but what's weird being able to fill in little little circles with ink but what's weird is you can pick more than one and not be wrong uh yes sure right there so, are no wrong answers exactly <laughs> <laughs> So then you you take your ballot when it's done, and mm-hmm. so far you haven't used any real technology. I mean, I guess the lights are arguably on, but that's it. Whatever. But then you take it to the end of the the lane, mm-hmm. and you wait your turn in front of this machine, and then you slide it into this little slot. The machine detects there's a piece of paper. It sucks it in and reads the filled in boxes. Presumably, mm-hmm. it has an internal count. It doesn't show you anything no, other than not. accepted. Yep. And that's it. You walk away and get your little voting sticker and walk out. Mm-hmm. That's the most important part is the voting sticker. It is. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what the typical e-voting experience is, at least here in, in our area. Yeah. And probably for the majority of uses in the United States. Uh, of course, there's other paper-based voting, you know, like an absentee ballot kind of thing. Right. That still exists and that's still fair. I don't think there's any widespread usage of the other kind of e-voting here in the United States. Right. And so what is that kind of e-voting? So that would be e-voting that does not take place at a physical polling location, right? Right. So this would be like online voting where you use your own personal device to submit your vote and, you know, it transmits it over the internet. Right. um, So I would call that the holy grail of e-voting. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. what the final destination would be and should be sometime in the future. And that's definitely what I would like to focus on in this episode because that is where like the 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 dynamic shift happens, mm-hmm. right? Is when we go from having to go into a location to being able to vote wherever and where whenever you want. Right. Yeah. And and so having that ability to to not only be uh, extracted from a specific location, mm-hmm. but even from a specific time, you have to be there, right? At, there at a time. Mm-hmm. So at least in our area, for sure, you can actually do early voting now. Yep. So it's not necessarily at the same place, but you can go somewhere else to vote mm-hmm. beforehand. Yeah. Well. And my brother took advantage of that because he was living with me, but his like official residence was mm-hmm. over at my parents' house in a different neighborhood. And right. so he was like, well, I don't want to have to get all the way up to the east side. Right. So he went and voted early at an, a location that was closer to us. Yeah. Imagine if you could just do that on your phone mm-hmm. while you're on the bus or mm-hmm. you know, just in your house on the couch. You know, it, would, it would make it easier to engage in that activity. I can vote from the toilet. You could. Not the best choice, maybe. I don't know. I mean, it's, eh. you, you, uh, dual, double dual tasking, you know. I see. <laughs> Efficiency. Right, and so that the, the holy grail is there. So it increases increases the ability for everybody to vote. It just mm-hmm. makes it better. So maybe we can talk briefly about why voting was done at polling places. Well, I think it, it would have been just out of necessity, right? Because right. it like travel times for people to get to a central area would have been too much, you know, before we had 
cars and everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so you would have to have a polling place that's close enough to every single citizen, right? Right. Of course, then they'd have to transport all those ballots to, you know, like more central locations where they get tallied up. And then, you know, like it kind of moves up the chain, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and and it also in, encouraged a, a community to kind of come together for a place, mm-hmm. especially in these smaller like state and regional city elections. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, if if this all could have done by could have been done by mail, sure, we just chose not to, right? And we chose to actually go there in person at a specific time once. Mm-hmm. So there were alternatives, but we didn't do them. Yeah, 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 and. There are different pieces, like, currently of our voting system that are done electronically, Mm -hmm. right? Like, when I was moving over the summer, I didn't go into a location to, like, change my voting registration address, right? I went on to the the post office's website, and as I was changing my official address through them, I just checked a box saying, like, also switch my voting registration, please. Right. And so then I like I didn't have to bring an ID with me or anything when I went and voted because I was already registered at the new location. Yep. Yeah. So is so that that already has part of the system ready to go. Mm-hmm. And well, we will discuss now mm-hmm. some of the other things that can be done in a, in in a, the e voting scheme to get us closer to that holy grail. Right. Take it away, Ryan. I will take it away. Thanks, Ian. So. <laughs> Let's talk about some traditional voting requirements, just kind of at a high level. Sure. So, you know, what are the requirements to vote, at least here? Like the requirements for a person to vote? Yeah. Uh, well, you have to be at least 18. Yep. Um, you have to be a citizen. Mm-hmm. You have to... Live uh, yeah. in that area. Yep. <laughs> yep. I can't vote in the New York elections, right? Right. I mean, you could try. It probably won't succeed. I'm yeah. not very good at lying. Right. You, you know, you have to not be currently in jail. I, th- I don't think you can be like an ex-convict or something either. Uh, I think in some de- places it depends on like your parole status. Right. Uh, so there are certain requirements, right? Yep. So we have to make sure that the people who can vote can vote. And mm-hmm. The people who can't, can't. Wow. Right? What a revolutionary concept. It is, but it's hard to do. Mm-hmm. We also have to make sure that every vote that is placed is only counted once. Yep. Um, and exactly once. Exactly once. Mm-hmm. But we also have to make sure that the vote people make is counted once in the form they make it in. Okay. So let's say you submit a ballot and, you know, it's a ballot for, you know, the governor of your state. Sure. Well, if you submit a blank ballot, you should still be counted as voted. Mm-hmm. But it's just, no, you didn't vote for anybody. It's okay. Right. Like, you chose that and it's fine. Mm-hmm. It's not an error. Your vote isn't not counted. It's counted, but no, no, nobody's count rows. Right. Right? You should also be able to count null votes. Null votes are like intentionally voting for something that doesn't exist. Okay. So if you're voting for your governor and you vote for the llama. Yeah, right. Well, that should still count for the llama's score, but it doesn't actually matter. <laughs> Alpaca 2018. Right. And, and so I think another good one is that we need to ensure that the secrecy of voting maintains uh, its integrity right. at all stages of the process. Yes. So when you go to the local polling place and you, you get your little blue card that enables you to go up to get the, the, the ballot, mm-hmm. the way the, I think the reason they do these very discrete parts of the process is so that whoever handles that thing doesn't handle the next stage. Mm. So whoever signs you in, who knows your name now because they had you sign in on the book, mm-hmm. they don't have anything to do with the ballot. Interesting. Yeah. When you take the ballot, the machine handles the next part. So it's even not even a person. Yeah. And as you're walking from your little booth to the machine, you've got that little sleeve that the ballot goes in so that nobody can see what you voted for. Right. And then the machine just... Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's steps of isolating uh, any individual from any part of the process. Mm-hmm. So a good good way to think about it is if somebody handles one part of your experience for the voting process, they are not allowed to handle any other part. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't even mean when you're just there. It also includes counting votes, recounting votes, mm-hmm. verifying that the machines work, verifying that the pens work, whatever. Like a person has one job and that's it. Mm-hmm. That can not always happen due to logistics, of course, but the closer you get to that, the better. Right. Accessibility is important, so making sure that there's no special privileges to vote. Over the history of America, we've had problems with that. Yeah, no so, kidding. So, so ensuring that limiting 
ensuring that votes aren't limited to the privileged right. is an important as aspect of what voting is supposed to be for, mm -hmm. whether or not actually that happens. And I like this last one, ensuring confidence in the process. So basically, this is marketing, right? You have yes. to convince everybody that the process that we're using to vote is one that actually works, that fulfills the rest of these requirements. Right. And so this is one of the most interesting ones going to the next stage of this. So mm -hmm. we were just talking about traditional voting requirements. Mm -hmm. What is the base minimum that needs to happen and be true for voting to work? Yeah. Or at least the goals. And to make sure this, this process has confidence that it'll work, it actually takes a lot when you start adding technology into it. Yeah. I mean, people tend to, you know, be a little uh, distrustful of new technology for some reason. Well, I can't imagine why. I, and I don't even know if it's distrust. It's just, it's another word for not knowing anything about technology. What is that? Ignorance? Yeah, but it, ignorance sounds so negative. It's, it's just technology is so complicated and it gets more complicated all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I'm a computer science person. I'm a software engineer. Mm -hmm. And the complexity of a of a true e-voting system mm -hmm. in its technological form is mind-boggling right right even for me to even comprehend it and explain here so it's not a simple thing and so how do you explain to a normal person who has no clue about encryption and cert certifications mm -hmm. and um latency and, like, like it's easy to explain to somebody how we're going to ensure security you know if all of the paper votes are going to be tallied like by hand you know we right. tell them okay you're going to put it into this box the box is locked nobody can open the box right. until it gets to the counting place right. and when it have, gets to the counting place they don't know who you are because they've never seen you right. you know and we have the blue slips to to do a, a count against uh -huh. so there's ah, yeah yeah so there's there's so many protections. A, a checksum, if you will. Oh my gosh, what's a checksum? That sounds <laughs> like money. So it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about some of the e-voting requirements. So okay. in addition to all the things we just listed, these would be things that e-voting should enable us to have or that it needs to protect against. Right. So fail-safe voter privacy means that your votes must be preserved backwards and forwards in an election. Mm -hmm. So when backwards you, and forwards in time. Yes. Okay. So you don't necessarily care sixty years in the future, dozens of elections later, what your vote was, mm -hmm. and nobody will either, probably. Well, and yeah. so the, after my death, I certainly don't care. So so the the system needs to be able to prevent coercion on previous votes, mm -hmm. backwards in time from when it's implemented, and in the future. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to last forever doesn't have to have perfect encryption, perfect security. just needs to be good enough for a reasonably long amount of time. Right. Collusion needs to be taken into account. You need collusion-free so, voting. So does that also mean that you have to ensure that, like, the person, while they are voting, they don't have anybody physically around them that is going to force them to vote a certain way? Right. That's mm. what it means. But, but not only that... If you have some kind of encryption going on in your system, if you have some kind of computer system in your in your system, mm -hmm. imagine that. If you have some kind of agent working along with your technology mm -hmm. and it's eventually circumvented, okay. the voting result, whatever the artifact of you casting your ballot is, should be good enough, should be strong enough in its form that they nobody can use it against you for a reasonable length of time in the future. Okay. So... That means you just need to use strong enough encryption if you're using encryption. Mm -hmm. If you're using, you know, a computer system, it needs to be reasonably secure for a long enough period of time. Okay. So, huh. the, so, so another one would be uh, verifiable election integrity. So you need to accept votes from each person only once, uh -huh. and only valid votes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So that's a really simple one, and it should be simple enough to do it in a in a kind of an e-voting fashion, mm -hmm. something kind of online voting. But think about how many, um, you know, when you go to one of those websites and it offers you six different ways to log in, you got your Facebook and your Twitter <laughs> yeah. and your Google Plus and, and username and password. How do you ensure that somebody doesn't log in six times right. to the e-voting website mm -hmm. and vote six times, even though they've been the same person? Yeah. So yeah. You, have to, you have to make sure that happens. Especially in a country like the U.S. where we have no national like ID number. Right. And even though we do? Except that it's not one that has any security built into it. No. Yeah. 
right? So, um, so you need fail safe privacy and verification. So, mm -hmm. should any vote for some reason come under dispute through maybe a court order or through some vulnerability in the system, mm -hmm. the voter maybe they can learn the value of the vote, like you know which party or which candidate or whatever, right? But they can't learn from that individual vote where it came from, who mm -hmm. did it, right? So. I don't know how often that happens, but that's something that the system should take into account. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really interesting one that you might not think of when you're doing, uh, when you're making an e-voting system, but human auditing. Okay. So when you go to the, the the polling booth right now, when you you know take part in your local election, mm -hmm. you'll you'll have your little paper slip, and the machine will suck it in. Those pieces of paper are getting digitized effectively. The boxes are read and counted up, and it maintains an internal tally. Yep. But those pieces of paper are part of the trail. Yeah. Those never go away. So if there's any reason to doubt what happens in the machine, you still have the paper. Yep. So the e-voting the e system, whether it's online or further electronicized, mm -hmm. the votes still need to be human readable somehow. So a human needs to be able to understand not who voted, but what the votes are mm -hmm. and how to count them. Right. Right. So... Maybe that means whenever you do an e-voting scenario, not only does it go to some server, it also prints out a piece of paper somewhere. Yeah. But you can just imagine how awful that'll be. Yeah, and how do you guarantee that, right? You can't. Because, um, yeah, I, I, I paper jams. Yeah, it's just, it's just not, not good. Yeah. So complete accuracy. So regardless if a person performs a blank vote, which is just not voting for somebody mm -hmm. in an, uh, you know, on a ballot... Or a null vote, you need to record it, mm -hmm. regardless. And the system need, needs to actually be made specifically aware that that's an option. Right. So a lot of computer systems will ensure that all of the boxes in a form need yeah. to be filled in. Yep. Well, this is not one of those times. Right. Not all the boxes need to be filled in. They should be warned that you're, you know, you didn't fill anything. Are you sure that's what you intended? Mm -hmm. But it needs to be allowed. Right. But on the other hand, you also need to prevent overvoting. So okay. that's when you fill in too many boxes mm, mm -hmm. for a position. Or if you pick two governors to uh, be your governor. Right. You can't do that. That's not right. <laughs> so it needs to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to allow undervoting, which is you can either leave it blank. You can't per You can't have too many votes cast mm -hmm. per, uh, you know, too many boxes filled in for any individual. But you can have too few right and so like that's for, okay for example for our mayor election we had you know a, a ranked choice system right i had up to six spots that right. i could do if i only had if i only cared about five people right that's I, okay yep now it could warn you that you still have one position left mm -hmm. are you sure this is what you intended mm -hmm. and you can say yes or you could say no yep this is a really interesting one, and this is one that I think is un overlooked in a lot of hypothetical e-voting systems that I've seen. Authenticated styles. So what this means is, uh, so hypothetically, this is taking place on the internet yeah. from a website. Yep. Well, people will, um, and, and it's just not styles, it's also other resources. So mm -hmm. when they're pulling Google Analytics in, okay. Um, okay. you need to know what's coming in. So Google Analytics could totally just rewrite your entire web page if it wanted to that's right right and so whether whether the the, the assets on the page or whether the styles whatever the case might be only secure assets can come in from authenticated known to be good sources uh -huh. so this allow you know this should in theory ensure consistency between ballots which is important because if if some people's ballot for some reason looks a different way mm -hmm. it might influence the vote somehow yeah, and you know what I just realized? Browser extensions kind of kill. Oh yeah, like I mean, having a. It, it's very difficult. Yeah, redundant redundancy of links. So, what do you do to make sure that a uh, DOS attack, a distributed denial of service attack, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that that doesn't break the voting system mm -hmm. too badly? And while I, I actually have an example of what that might look like in another section. Okay. Offline security. So. When when you start taking this digital stuff offline, how do you make sure that you can not only securely read it and write to it, mm -hmm. I guess if you wanted to write to it, I'm not sure, but how do you also securely and correctly verify that it all happened right? Mm -hmm. So maybe a machine can do all of this fancy hashing and cryptography and right. all of these amazing algorithms, but how do you make it something 
that a human can also do. Okay. Maybe not to the same level of certainty. So maybe a machine can get to that, you know, five nines of this is true. Uh huh. Maybe you can get it to 99% for a human. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's good enough. So that's an interesting thing. Technology independence. You can use it on any platform, presumably. Right. You can't just vote with iOS devices, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. You can't just vote with Google devices. Are you telling me that we shouldn't use a Java applet? Uh, no. Please, <laughs> please do not use a Java applet. <laughs> and, and finally here, I think that this is really important. It needs to be open source. Mm. Whatever this thing is, this e-voting platform, all of the technology that's used for it specifically mm -hmm. needs to be open source. Right. If anybody offers to you, hey, I've got an e-voting system, it's only $500,000, can I see the source code? No. You should say no. I don't want that. Yes. You know, and they, that... they say that you should vote with your wallet. <laughs> and and the way to do that is to not pay for the thing. The way to do it is to pay for an open source version for everybody. Right. And that goes a long ways for that, that last note for the, the general requirements for a voting system is ensuring confidence in the process, right. right? Because if anybody can go and read the source code and verify that it is working the way that it should be, then that will instill a lot of confidence. Right? So when you think about that confidence angle from these, I don't know, maybe 16 points or so, yeah. how do you make sure that everybody's confident in all of these things being met? How do you take an average person who has no time for any of this mm -hmm. to understand that our miraculous technological offering is actually doing any of this at all. Well, I mean, I, I should hope that the your average user isn't going to be any more leery of this kind of system than they are about, you know, the current voting system where we, at least, like, I don't know exactly where the ballots go after, mm -hmm. you know, I fill it out. I don't know who's counting it up. I, you know, I just kind of, I've, I trust that, you know, a system has been put in place that actually ensures all of these security measures, right? Yes, exactly. And I think one of the problems with voting and then adding the E part on top of it, yeah. that E part is really big. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of places in that E part to get random consulting agencies involved, mm -hmm. to get random big businesses involved to to get um big interests of money involved so that there's undue corruption in the system mm -hmm. before it's actually even helped. So that's something that you have to be really careful of. Right. Yeah. Cool. So that's those are the requirements. Let's talk about a an overall implementation. And okay. I don't and I don't want to get too technical on this, but I, I do have this beautiful website that I've made that has all this content on it. Yeah. And Please, please go visit it. The uh, link is in the show notes. Yes, and one day it'll also even be secure, so watch out. Um, <laughs> so so this, this procedure, and this is sort of technical, so there's a server. A server is uh -huh. a computer in the cloud. Whoa. Whoa. And this, this server will collect a list of all these votes. Sure. Right. And so this list is going to be there, mm -hmm. holding all the votes. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem with that? It's only one server? Yes, it's only one server. Who controls that server? The government. Who is the government? The the entity that... <laughs> I thought that you were going to say the people. ...governs us? Right. But at any given time, at least in the federal government, who is the government? It's a, it's a vast collection of people. I mean... Yes what? and no. It's a big bureaucracy. It, 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 all, it also ends up being one-ish party, at least in the United States. Okay. Right, and so now you have to trust that your one-ish party will be true, and not randomly mug votes on okay. the central server. Mm -hmm. So let's say you set up some kind of Fed-like voting agency thing. So something that's slightly outside of the federal government rules, even though it's called the Fed and it's totally within the federal government rules. Mm -hmm. Now you have to trust some rogue organization that's not totally rogue, but sort of rogue. Mm -hmm. Even worse for confidence. So now you start thinking, okay, well let's add some, uh, you know technological magic in there. Mm -hmm. So let's add some hashes. Let's add some uh, encryption. Let's add some kind of uh, verification method. Mm -hmm. Well, A blockchain? Well, maybe, maybe you add a blockchain. Well, so now we get to some other problems. So you've already said that the central server needs to be trusted. Yeah. Like that's a clear one. Mm -hmm. So we can maybe fix that by making multiple parties need to track the result of a vote. Okay. So maybe you have 
three different parties in the or maybe you have your two party system of course in the United States mm -hmm. but maybe you have dozens of vote collection servers mm -hmm. so that if any individual server tries to tamper with the vote result right, right. Eh, there's a majority of them that didn't mm -hmm. and so the majority version will win of course if they all end up colluding with each other then right. you lose anyway yeah but that's sort of hard well and and like in the current like in a, in a system that uses physical ballots how do you ensure that those haven't been tampered with if you know the federal exactly. government is is keeping it's them really anyway doing. yeah so the way that that works at least locally is that it won't matter because the federal government never actually sees your vote at a local level mm -hmm. for a federal election. Okay. Right? So the, the ballot never goes to Washington, D.C. to get counted. Mm -hmm. It gets counted in your precinct area, mm -hmm. and then your aggregate count gets counted in your region, mm -hmm. and then in your state, and then it gets reported, and then you lose. So do we, do we like, replicate that kind of system in, on, like, as a server structure? You could, but here's the problem with that. Local voters will suffer. So local votes and voters will suffer because local elections are m so much smaller. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure set all this up will cost way too much for a local election. Mm. So maybe California, because it's a huge state and everybody lives there, can afford it. Mm -hmm. But North Dakota will have no hope of finding people who care and paying them right, and getting all the infrastructure set up and it not being hacked by China the next day. Yeah. So it's it's difficult for that. What this sounds like is like the concept of I'm a small company. I don't have the resources to set up my own email server infrastructure. So I'm just going to go and pay Google to do it. Exactly. Right. But now, but we don't want to. We don't want to do that with voting. No, yeah. no, you don't. Um, or Facebook. Sure. Oh, yeah, that Facebook email system. So let's say that we actually did use. We actually did have, for some reason, the, the federal government just made an offer to all the states for any regional voting. You can just use our systems. Cool. Uh -huh. No problem. Let's say that there's a, a federal election for president and other positions. Mm -hmm. How many voters do you think actually vote on whatever day in November it is? Like who, who don't vote early but vote on the day uh, on of? On the day of. I think that the majority of voters vote on the day of. Yeah, but what? how many people do you think that is? Oh, it's in the millions for it, sure. It is in the millions. Yeah. About approximately 128 million. Okay. Which is a really nice number. <laughs> um, so it's 128 true. million people voting mm -hmm. in roughly eight hours. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Ooh, boy. kind yeah. of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So this, this, this article that I have written here was from a while ago, but it still scales fairly well. So mm -hmm. in, in October of 2015, Apple, you might have heard of this company, yeah. very small, not a big deal, sold 13 million iPhone 6S units from their website and associated portals uh -huh. in only 72 hours. Okay. In that period of time, now 13 million, that sounds like, you know, small compared to 128 million voters. But they're in the same realm of of millions yeah exactly well but here's the thing they're in the same that order of magnitude two hours which is like three days right 13 million versus 128 million in, in eight, eight hours. hours yeah how do you keep servers up mm -hmm. so when apple is the richest company in the world and can have all the servers they could ever want and more how do you get the federal government or any local government any state government mm -hmm. to actually have the ability to keep those servers up yeah functioning and responsive it's gonna for be that time. it's gonna have to be very distributed it would be that's really hard yeah yeah and and so maybe you think well maybe your central server is a bottleneck there so now let's have those you know dozens of other you know result collection servers take in some of that slack mm -hmm. some of that you know offer that service well now you have to have dozens of other servers that need to be almost as beefy as the central server but just dozens of them mm -hmm. so the costs even get higher mm -hmm. so it's not a simple thing so it would have to be more distributed than even that mm -hmm. and uh that's uh, not easy so so if that wasn't good enough now the holy grail of internet voting is to do it not in person to do it from wherever you are on the bus in the train at home at the dining room table whatever yep in the podcast studio Oh, yeah. I just voted. So there's a problem with that. Yeah. It's the thing that you're holding while you're listening to this episode. It's that phone. It's that iPad. It's that device. It's that computer. Yeah. The problem is the client. Mm -hmm. How do you trust the client? Exactly. 
So what do you know about computers? I know that once I visit a website, I can do whatever the heck I want with that website, and the like the website server can't do a thing about it. Are you sure? For the most part, yeah. So you can visit a website, and you can do whatever you want to it. Mm-hmm. So you can go to uh, YouTube.com, for example, and... You know, it's really annoying because everything is so bright on that website. You can turn its dark mode on yep. with an extension. Yeah. That's super cool. But now let's say um, you go to vote.gov mm-hmm. and you click blue person Okay. for your vote. Okay. How do you know blue person was recorded on the server as your vote? Yeah. How do you know that? Like maybe, now this is hypothetical. So you say you clicked blue person and maybe it sends you an email or something. Mm-hmm. And it says, hmm. you voted for blue person. So now it's kind of an asynchronous thing. It's confirming what you just did. Yeah. Okay, well, so now what if, now this is hypothetical, what if you've been pre-infected with some kind of Trojan or virus or, okay. some, or, or thing, such that when you click blue person, it's really voted for red person, mm-hmm. and when you get that confirmation email, it reads what it what's in the email and changes it just on the fly. Okay. How can you trust... This is a pretty... Uh... Pretty Anything. sophisticated man in the middle attack. Yeah. But it's not even a man in the middle attack. It's on the client. Right, yeah. You can't trust anything that you see on your computer if anything else has agency on it. Mm-hmm. So when you even see the list of candidates, how do you know those are the list of candidates? Yeah. How do you know when you click a thing, it's actually doing what you wanted, which is to presumably vote for that person? Mm-hmm. You can't know. So then you need some kind of authenticated, safe verification method so maybe you you have your phone which is hooked up to your email but what if your phone's infected the same way now maybe it's good enough that it's two different systems involved there so maybe in that case where it mm-hmm. you know sends you that yeah, confirmation. but not everybody owns two different devices exactly so it's extremely difficult to have the client be trusted mm-hmm. so what about the operating system level so like it's a browser, right, that's normally running these things. But yeah. what if it's even worse? So what if it's even more insidious? The the infection goes even below the browser level. Mm-hmm. So when your packets are sent out, it rewrites them completely. You just don't know. Right. Now what? Well, now we're going to have to figure out how to get, like, secured physical computer systems out there to everybody else so So, that they can vote wherever they are. So there is a possible future. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of work in the last few years. So I wrote this original amount of content about this voting, e-voting system Mm -hmm. back in 2015. And since then, there's been a lot of work in this blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. By the way, blockchain. Blockchains. So blockchain has a lot of interesting things. So first of all, it's distributed. Mm-hmm. Which means yep. it can scale up a lot better, in theory, than a centralized server or even many collection servers. Mm-hmm. It can rely on just normal people like yourself having a window open on their machine with an internet connection with some even small amount of bandwidth just contributing to the overall pool mm-hmm. of power, computing power. Right. So that's great. But, but beside that, it also has other benefits. So... You can use a blockchain system to ensure with something called proof of stake that something actually happened. Okay. So proof of work is kind of a thing where you just brute force a bunch of stuff until you get the right answer. Mm-hmm. Proof of stake relies on something that's in the hardware level on your processor. Okay. It's a special module that can accept a function and will tell you if the function's been run and not changed while running. What kind of hardware systems have that built in? Intel chips. Okay. Oh, okay. oh, wait. Did I just spill the beans? Here's the problem. Now we have to trust a single vendor again. Right. Yeah. Big business. So even the Bitcoin blockchain thingamajig approach won't work. Okay. Now what? Is that kind of hardware level verification required for a blockchain system to be valid? No. But it's required to execute functions securely and to know they weren't tampered with. Okay. So how, the, the question of the clients are, how do you make sure that as a user you know what you did actually happened? Mm-hmm. And so using that secure module, you could, in theory, know that what you did actually happened on mm-hmm. your machine at least. Mm-hmm. Of course, what about your router? What about upstream? You know, all these things. Right. Hopefully HTTPS, SSL, TLS will secure some of that. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Hopefully you didn't get crack attacked. Right. 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 So there's this whole series of blocks that are just not very block shaped. Mm -hmm. They're they're kind of rounded on the edges there. And and they need to be good enough to get all the way up to the top. Mm -hmm. But are they? Yeah. It's... This whole conversation is making me, you know, realize that there are many, many, many things that we trust on, you know, like with an internet connection, uh, you know, like my online banking, my, you know, many things, right? That probably shouldn't really be trusted with just like a, a regular internet connection. Right. But we do it anyway. We do it because, anyway. Because convenience. So convenience is a really good like overview word. Mm-hmm. So what I like to call it is, is accessibility. Mm-hmm. So... All of this stuff you could do in person. Yep. Just like e-voting, you don't have to be there in person, but you could do it in person at your polling place. Mm-hmm. So accessibility is that true, like, like you can just do it. It's conveniently accessible. Yeah. And and so that's that's a great advantage. It's a great pro. But the 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 huge amount of hardware issues and software issues. Mm-hmm. How do you get anybody to be confident that it'll work? How do you even get technologists to be confident that it'll work? <laughs> That's a really good question. Yeah. That pro will get shadowed by that con mm-hmm. constantly, mm-hmm. just indefinitely. That's why they call it a con. I guess constantly. so. So maybe what we have right now is good enough. Mm-hmm. But but here's here's something interesting. We use e-voting all the time. So when we go to the the polling place, we use that machine. That's that's e-voting. Yep. It's not the holy grail. Right. But maybe it's good enough. Mm-hmm. It still uses the paper. It still has an auditing trail. It maintains an electronic count itself, but the paper's there for if you need it. Yeah. There is actually a place that we know of that actually uses e-voting. Like on- in- online e-voting. The holy grail mm-hmm. e-voting. Online, yeah. you can do it from your house. You can do it wherever you are. Mm-hmm. And that's Estonia. Okay. What a weird place to... I've heard of them. To suddenly just have an e-voting. They've been doing it since 2005. And they're one of those... Those three tiny countries that's like below Finland, right next to Russia, right? Something like that's, that. That's where Estonia is. So, so here's how their version of e voting works. Mm-hmm. Every citizen has an ID card. That sounds like a key part of this. Wait, so you're telling me that by giving everybody a cryptographically secure ID card when they turn whatever age is uh, ageful in their country mm-hmm. is a good idea? No way. Hmm. So this ID card has a smart chip in it, which okay. presumably has some kind of encrypted module in it. Mm-hmm. So then what you do when you want to vote is you get one of these smart card chip readers. So I I either imagine they're like $10 or free, okay. and you're just given one with your card. And you need an internet connection with your chip card reader. Uh-huh. So when you want to vote, you put your card into the reader. Is this reader plugged into your personal device? Yes. Or? Okay. So your computer, uh-huh. I guess maybe they don't do it with their phone, but it's computer based. <sighs> okay. You know, it came out in two thousand five. They didn't have phones then. Oh, uh, you know, with a with a USB C to USB A <laughs> adapter, I could plug it into my phone. Drivers not supported. Yeah. yeah. So what they do then is you plug your card in. You, the thing's done whatever it does on your computer. Mm-hmm. You enter a PIN, and then you fill out your ballot. Your ballot is then signed with the combination of your PIN code. Mm and your card's unique identifier, Mm -hmm. and then it's encrypted and sent off. Yep. And then there's a second pin involved that you are given when you do that process so that you can query later that your vote was recorded the way you wanted it to be. Okay. And if you want to change your vote, use that second pin again. Whoa. You can change your vote anytime and as many times up until the cutoff period, which is presumably the day. The cutoff day being election day. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's encrypted, and then they have some kind of mechanism that can uh, read those votes at their central server. Mm -hmm. And so it's encrypted in the sense that whoever voted is encrypted, not the actual values. Those go out, and they're just out there. Okay. So the actual votes on the list, the ballot itself, it's not encrypted. Mm -hmm. The proof that you did it, but not you, that's encrypted. Right. Right. And it goes out to their central server, they're tallied out, and it's great. But what are the problems? 
Well, I keep coming back to the fact that you can't guarantee that there wasn't any physical coercion going on because people can be anywhere and everywhere when Mm -hmm. they vote. And so there's no guarantee that there wasn't somebody like with a gun to their head, you know, unless guns are, you know, illegal in Estonia. I have no idea. It could be. But how do you guarantee that the the computer they used wasn't compromised? Mm -hmm. Exactly. How can you make sure that the second pin hasn't been used in a coercion attack. Exactly. You can't. You know, maybe Estonia is so small that they still have enough people involved in the process somewhere along the chain Mm -hmm. that maybe it's okay. Like, they don't have to worry about all of these things. Mm -hmm. But when you start getting into the hundreds of twenties of millions of people, it's too big for any amount of people to coordinate effectively at that scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's a great thing we have states doing it instead. So it's just right. a few tens of millions of people. Unless you're California. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then it's not just a few. But it's still too, it's just so big. So even Estonia's version of e-voting, well, it is pretty much Holy Grail-style voting. Mm-hmm. It's not quite perfect. Right. Now, here's the question. Have So since we do have this one example of e-voting, have we seen the problems that we've been talking about occurring in their voting system. Also, have we seen, like, the advantages of, uh, you know, allowing people to vote from wherever and whenever? Have we seen, like, voter turnout increase, right? Yeah, I think I was unable to find the Estonia voting records from (laughs) pre-2005 to Uh post-2005. And that's that's too bad because I think that would have been really useful to know if e-voting... That Holy Grail style really did impact. Mm-hmm. I I have no I have no evidence to support that it wouldn't. I I don't I don't uh, I don't know what would stop somebody from just doing it if they had the ability to vote out of their pocket. Yeah, and so according to this Wikipedia article here about online voting, they said that the prom- the pro- par- parliamentary elections that they uh, were doing in, in 2007 in Estonia um, showed that rather than eliminating inequalities, e-voting might have enhanced the digital divide between higher and lower so- socioeconomic classes. Right? Yes, and, and so here in the United States, for sure, that is just rampant. Mm-hmm. There are people who, in those wealthy positions that can vote effortlessly. It wasn't even a concern from them. Mm-hmm. But in the lower classes of society here, for sure, you might just not have an internet connection at home. Right. On the other hand, like our current system obviously doesn't prevent that kind of inequality from taking place, even though we have polling places close enough to you know everybody's like living space. Right. But like... But you then know, you but, have to be there before 8 p.m. Exactly. And if you're working late because you have to feed your three children, yep. you don't get to. Exactly. Yeah, so it's like so what what do we do? Do we do we uh improve the distribution technology that we have to to the point where we can just like get voting machines out to people like, you know, to people wherever they are no matter what they're currently doing um and just be like, "Hey, you vote." And... Yeah, so I've been thinking on this topic for a number of years, mm-hmm. and what we have now is fine. Okay, and we can make very minor improvements to it to get it better. Mm-hmm. So, such as allowing it to count up all of the votes within twenty minutes, perfect. right? And and, uh, if, and if it looks like there's some kind of weird, you know, anomaly, aberration, yeah. anomaly, complete reverse expectations kind of thing, yeah, you can go in and have it a, recount a or, travesty, yeah. You can have it recount automatically. You just hit the recount button. Mm-hmm. Or you can take the papers out of the bucket and count them yourself. Right. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. You can have your e-voting machines, your, your 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 ballot counters, basically. You can have them start to get open sourced. Okay. You can have the firmware, the software. You can even have the parts and the manufacturers listed publicly and available for mm-hmm. inspection. Mm-hmm. You can have a more clear balance of voting locations to transit accessibility right those are more social things i yeah. think and maybe not in the realm of you know technology and and, and voting and, and stuff necessarily mm-hmm. but those are also extremely important ways to increase the ability for people to vote right with those technologies right so i think what we have now is pretty good mm-hmm. you go into a place with some paper you use it and then digital stuff happens yeah especially if you're 
like the rest of the process is easily available online, right? The registration process, the logging into a website to see if you are registered process, right? You know, like those parts, I think, don't have to be as rigorously like protected. Right, for sure. Right. Because um, you can still go to your polling place, like, and bring your your address, your 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 electricity bill with your address on it, mm-hmm. and your ID, and, yeah. and get readmitted to that area, even if there was some kind of weird error right. on the website. As long as yeah, as long as you live in a state that has fairly progressive voting well, laws, right? You know, well, that's that's one thing we need to fix too, right? Yeah, yeah. I will I will note that the the current system that we have has failed me once because i was in sweden over fall break uh in 2014 or fall break fall fall semester and i did not realize that the absentee voting process like that i that i wouldn't be able to print off the ballots myself it's it's you know and stuff like that Mm -hmm. so i just i didn't have any of it right because i was too far away yeah (laughs) and and i think that's uh a shame of our current system. Mm-hmm. From what I understand, sometimes e- uh, absentee ballots don't even get counted unless there's a, a large enough hmm. margin. Hmm. So it really makes you even question the va- you know the value of some of those votes, which is also terrible to say. Right. Yeah. And if and and in this holy grail scenario of online voting, like when every vote is like an absentee vote, right. quote, now know, what? <laughs> then then well then then every vote is treated the same, right? You right. know. So. So that that's good, but mm-hmm. is it good enough? Because now you have to deal with a whole host of other problems. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe some of these problems are completely manufactured. So if you had a platform that you could completely trust, mm-hmm. that was completely locked down from any outside agents, mm-hmm. maybe you could do it. Maybe there's a platform right now that is almost close to that. I feel like you're trying to get me to name something. Yes. But I... It could be iOS. Oh, okay. Right? So, so think about iOS. You, you, uh-huh. you have your iPhone... Can something install itself on your iPhone? Not really. It is as locked down as it really gets. Mm-hmm. I don't think anything can spoof a button on top of another button. I don't think right. rogue background processes can intercept other foreground processes. I think the iPhone might be the most secure portable computer available oh, yeah. to a large majority of people. And, but like, like you said, there's all of the steps in between all of the right. routers and, you know, now switches what? that it has to go through before it can get to the actual server. And, well, and then know. what, is it a server or is it a blockchain? Sure. Yeah. Right. Whichever. Yeah. And so then let's say you can kind of get through some of that using various levels of transport encryption. Mm-hmm. Great. Now you've got to have a way for the government actually to implement it all. And for all the people to have some kind of iOS-like device mm-hmm. available to them. Mm-hmm. just It's just paper. Just use paper. Yeah. You know how cheap paper is? Pretty cheap. Pretty, yeah. One iPhone. Tell, tell that to the trees. One iPhone can buy a lot of trees. <laughs> that's, that's very true. Yeah. That's very, very true. Yeah. So I, I, guess, I guess my conclusion of my e-voting guide is is to not necessarily devi- de- desire that holy grail. Mm-hmm. It it's um, and it's a weird thing as a technologist, as a software engineer, to say you know we are not the solution to this. Right. Right. We just aren't. Yeah. We, we can't help in this regard. It's too risky. It's too hard. Mm-hmm. There's no solution right now. Yeah, and I'm and I'm sure that like. Given enough time, right, enough technological progress. Maybe it'll lot, happen again in the future. Yeah, a lot of these problems will just kind of like not be not be as big of issues because like, you know, like server loads of capacity is, you know, going to improve right. greatly, right? And, and the reliability the, of uh, blockchain solutions will mm-hmm. improve. Right. But there are also weird hypothetical issues in the future too. With technology advancing, so when, you know, in, in 15 years, are we going to have computers that you can still install anything you want, or is it only going to be things from walled gardens? Right. So now, let's say that's true. Let's, you can only install your voting application from the Pineapple Store. Okay. Well, the Pineapple Store can do whatever they want to that application, presumably, even though the government submitted it. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you trust it? Big business again. Is it open source? Well, it is, but how do you know the compiled binary is truly the one that is 
in the source code. Right. You don't know because now it's a walled garden. Right. If you didn't install Unless it on the Unless they give you like the hash of it to verify or something like that. I don't know. And, the hash know, is on the screen. It's spoofed. Exactly. I don't know. It's, it's, it's fake all the way down and up and everywhere. Mm-hmm. Paper. It's the only thing I can re- recommend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please vote and with paper. <laughs> Yeah. So there's there's a few things that we talked about in this episode that, you know, we don't have time to go super deep into, but we've done other episodes about, such as encryption. Um, we have a nice uh, explainer about on a previous episode of The Extra Dimension. Also, blockchains. I'm, I'm hoping that in the future we can do an episode of The Extra Dimension where we dive pretty deep into those and, and talk about how they work and i've got even little toy blocks we can play with fantastic yes this episode of the extra dimension is released creative commons attribution so if you would like to take any portions of the episode feel free to use them in any way that you like as long as you link back to the original source and uh yeah if if you have any uh, feedback for us about this episode feel free to get in touch with us at, on Twitter at the Nexus TV or send us an email at the Nexus TV at gmail.com uh, Ryan where can people find you on the internet well you can find me evoting on my website at ryanrampersad.com and on Twitter where I also talk about evoting every election year and I have been Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. And uh, my website, where I have links to other stuff that I make, is ianrbuck.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Have a good one. <laughs>